think we can hear a little bit of sound. I've entitled the message for tonight, Miracles and Wonders. Look at our text. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience. You know, that's a miracle. <laughs> that's a wonder when that takes place. When God causes someone to not say anything and to listen. Let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Now, this miracle took place at this time. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience. Now, there had been disputing going on shortly before this in verse 7. And when there had been much disputing going on in the multitude... Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren. Now, what was this disputing over? Well, it's stated in verse 1 of this chapter. The issue was law and grace. That's the issue of Acts chapter 15. Now, remember this. The church at Antioch was the church of Gentile believers. Remember when they were first called Christians at Antioch? And it was the representative of Gentile believers. And Jerusalem was the church that represented mainly Jewish believers. And there was a difference. And people came down from Jerusalem into Antioch, some church members. Certain men, verse 1, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be Say They were trying to bring in this Jewish law along with the gospel. Look in verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now that's what this dispute was about, and that's when Peter rises up. We considered this last week. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. And said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear <coughs> them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke? Upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. That's so important. He doesn't say they'll be saved like us. It says us Jews will be saved just like the Gentiles are. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that put that issue to rest. Now, upon Peter saying that, then all the multitude kept silence. They'd been disputing, now they're listening. And they gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now this word miracle is the word that's generally translated sign. Look in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is giving this first gospel message after the resurrection of Christ. He begins his message, verse 22, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Now the Lord demonstrated who he was by miracles and wonders and signs. He did what only God can do. He controlled the weather. Men could not possibly control the weather, but he did. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey? He healed the sick. He 
cleanse lepers. He gave sight to the blind. He brought matter into existence which was not in the universe before he did that. He raised the dead. He did what only God can do. And it was testified, proved by the miracles and wonders and signs which he did in everybody's presence. He came down from heaven and performed these miracles. And the disciples in the early church were given the ability to perform miracles. They healed people. They spoke in tongues. They spoke in other languages that they'd never learned before. And people heard the gospel through their speaking. While they were even used to raise the dead. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 9 when he raised Tabitha from the dead? Paul raised from the dead a man that had fallen out of a loft. They had miracle working power. Now, turn with me for a moment to Acts chapter 8. And this is very important. Then Philip, verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That was his message. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Along with his preaching, he was performing miracles that they bore witness to. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Peter came preaching and healing people and people were astonished. Now, what I think is interesting as you go on reading in this passage of Scripture, Philip could not confer these gifts on the people he was preaching to. He couldn't lay his hands on somebody and cause them to start being able to heal and speak in other languages, and raise the dead, and all the miracles that the apostles performed. Philip preached to them, but these gifts were not transferred until John arrived, and Peter. And look what it says in verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. Now, it was only the apostles that could transfer these gifts to others. This is important for us to understand this. And the scripture points this out. When they saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given for these miraculous healings and so on. After the apostles, these miraculous abilities died out. Now, you're going to run across people who claim to have miraculous powers to speak in tongues, to heal the sick, and all these different miracles they claim to have. But anytime somebody makes that claim, they're a phony. Now write that down. They're a phony. They're frauds. Because it was only through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were given, not through anybody else. So, after, so if, if the apostles laid hand on you and you were have this miracle uh, working ability, you couldn't get it to give it to somebody else. It only came through the laying on of the apostles' hands. You know, if somebody did have the gifts to heal and they don't go in hospitals and start healing, what kind of people are those people? I mean, if I had the gifts to heal, I'd go here to the UK and the hospital and heal everybody there and uh, they don't do that. You know why? Because they're phonies, because they're frauds. And that is the only reason. But the apostles had the ability to do this. And Paul and Barnabas spoke back in our text in Acts chapter 15. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now question, were they saying, we healed 14 sick people, we raised seven people from the dead. We gave sight to 23 blind men. 34 lepers were cleansed. Why would, no, that's not what they were speaking of at all. They were not speaking of physical miracles. They were talking about the 
miracles and wonders of salvation. I love that song, it took a miracle to put the stars in space. It took a miracle to hang the world in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Now, a few words regarding these physical signs before I get into the heart of this message. No one has ever been saved by observing a miracle. Turn with me for a moment to John chapter 12, and this is uh, when Paul was reading the scripture. He read this from Matthew chapter 13, and here it is used again by John. Look in verse 37 on a different account. Remember I said this is the most often quoted passage of scripture in the New Testament. Verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not. On him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, hath, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. And he spake of him. No one has ever been saved or brought to faith in Christ simply by seeing a physical miracle. Hadn't happened. Secondly, signs and wonders can be duplicated. Remember the Egyptian magicians? Pharaoh throws, I mean uh, Moses throws his staff, it becomes a snake. Well, the Egyptian magicians were able to do the same thing. They threw their staves down and they became snakes, but what ha uh, snakes, but what happened? Moses' snake ate all their snakes and came back. And they were able to turn water into blood. Moses turned the water into blood. Well, God did it through Moses and they did the same thing. And they were able to bring frogs out the way Moses did. But the one thing they couldn't do, I think is interesting, remember the next thing Moses turn dust into lice, living creatures. They couldn't do that. They couldn't bring life into existence, but they could duplicate many miracles. And didn't the Lord say in Matthew 24, he warned us of false prophets who would show great signs and wonders, that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. And then Paul said in 2 Thess Thessalonians 2, 9, he spoke of the man of sin, even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This man of sin will have all power and signs and lying wonders that will seem miraculous and real. We're told that ahead of time. Just because somebody can do something like that, that doesn't mean God's behind it. That's what he's telling us. And third thing I'd like to say, say about signs and miracles, it's always evil to look for one. Always. Now, somebody in here thinking, I'd like to see a sign and a miracle. <coughs> you know, Herod, when he, he was glad when they brought Christ for him. He, he hoped to see some miracle done by him. But to ask for a sign or a miracle, you're saying, I can't believe you. You're going to have to give me more proof. That's exactly what that means. That's why the Lord said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What if God would have said to Moses, Look at the stars. So shall your seed be. And he said, well, I can't believe it unless you prove it by showing me some kind of miracle right now. God is never to be spoken of to in that way, nor is the Lord Jesus Christ because of who he is. And I love what he said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And no sign's going to be given but the sign of Jonas. Three days in, three days out. You know, John actually said that, turn to John chapter 21. Last verse of 
the book of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. Speaking of all these miracles, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Oh, the miracles he performed. But look in verse 30 of chapter 20. And many other signs, that's the word miracles, and many other signs, Miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, and he is speaking of something specifically. In the book of John, he mentions six different miracles. And the whole book of John is the dialogue surrounding those miracles and people's response to those miracles. The first one is when he turned water into wine. And that's actually called the beginning of miracles or the most important miracle. The second one was when he healed the nobleman's son. And you remember what happened. Uh, he said, your son's healed. The nobleman goes back to his house. The next day, the people come to him and said, your son's been healed. He said, when did it happen? And they gave him the time and he knew it was whenever the Lord said it. That shows the supremacy of his will in salvation. And then the third miracle is found in John chapter 5, that impotent cripple laying by the pool of Bethesda. And the Lord said, wilt thou be made whole? And he said, well, I don't have anybody get me in the water. He said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And the fourth miracle was the miracle in John chapter 6 when he created bread. He created bread. A meal for some 15,000 people with five biscuits and two sardines. He brought matter into existence, which had not been in the universe before this. Then we have that beautiful story in John chapter 9 of him giving sight to one that was born blind. And then we have the miracle of Lazarus, laying in the grave four days, stinking. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Now, these are written, these six miracles and signs and wonders that John reports. There are many others in the other Gospels, but John is talking about what he's saying in this book that he's writing to us. Many other signs truly did Jesus in their presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, these six miracles and wonders. For this purpose, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through his name. Now those are the miracles and wonders which Paul and Barnabas were speaking of. They were talking about the miracles and wonders of his grace. And I want to briefly consider these six miracles and preach the gospel to you from that. Every one of these things are an aspect of how God saves sinners by Christ. Now turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. Water that was made wine. It was not water that looked like wine. It was not water that smelled like wine. It was not water that tasted like wine. It was wine. The water was made wine. Now in this miracle, something was made to be what it was not. The water was not wine, and it came to be wine. 
It was made what it was not, which is a commentary on one of the most mysterious, awe-inspiring scriptures in the Bible, which we quote all the time, and we can't do anything but believe it. We can't really so much explain it, but we can believe it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he was made to be sin. He was made to be what he was not. Now that's just veiled in mystery and we believe it. Somebody says, tell me how that is. I don't know, but it is. God did this. He was made to be sin. The sins of his people became his sins. And if you want to know what sin is, look at the cross. There it is. Forsaken by God. He was made to be what he was not. Sin. And let's finish the verse. We are made to be what we were not. For he hath made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now that is the mystery of the gospel. He was made sin. I think it is sad the way people say, are you saying that he became sinful on the cross and started committing sins? And, and no one ever thought anything like no one ever ex suspected anything like that. This doesn't mean when he was made sin, he was made sinful and made, started lusting and cursing and, and having covetous thoughts and like, no! Worse. It's worse than that. He was made sin. And there ain't nobody that can plumb the depths of what all that means. He was made sin. And just as truly as he was made sin, and the proof of that is the fact that his father forsook him. His father had nothing but wrath for him. He was not under the smile and pleasure of his father. His father forsook him. And just as, and he died. There's only one reason for death, sin. And just as he was made sin, Every believer is made the very righteousness of God in him. And I'm looking at some people who are the righteousness of God. Every believer. Now that is what that miracle teaches us of. He was made to be what he was not. Sin. That we might be made to be what we were not the righteousness of God. Water made wine. Now the second is found in John chapter 4. Verse 46. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, a courtier or ruler, my marginal reading says. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. He didn't have to go down, did he? Go your way, your son lives. He's not sick anymore. He lives. 
And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And this was the next day. And somebody pointed out that there wasn't that great of a distance. He just took his time getting home. He wasn't a bit worried about it. He knew his son lived. The Lord said his son lives. He knew he did. He wasn't, he wasn't in a hurry to get home. He thought, I'm going to take a leisurely trip. He spent the night somewhere. Didn't even try to get there back that same day. He believed what the Lord said. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. It left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Now what this tells us about is the supremacy of the will of Jesus Christ in salvation. The leper understood this. He said, Lord, he came and worshipped him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me whole. And that's the only way the Christ is to be approached. Acknowledging his sovereign will, knowing salvation is completely in his will. Can you imagine that leper saying, I've decided to let you heal me. I will that you heal me. No, it Nothing like that at all. If you will. Well, that's my prayer right now. If you will, you can make me clean. And then in John chapter 5, you know the story of the man. There were a bunch of people who were sick. And an angel would come once a year and stir the water. And whoever entered the water first, was healed of whatsoever plague he had. And there were five porches around this with multitudes of impotent folk, lot, lame, lying, halt, uh, sick, waiting for the stirring of the water. And we read in verse 5, and there was a certain man was there. A lot of men there, but there was also a certain man there. You know, the Lord always saves certain individuals. His salvation is never generic. If you're saved, you're the certain man he came to save. He came for you. A certain man. He was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he'd been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? That's a good question. Are you willing to be made whole? But the man didn't understand what he said. All he could think about was his inability to get in the water. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. He didn't hear what the Lord said. He didn't answer the Lord's question. That question could be answered with a yes or a no. But he brought something else out. I need this to happen. It doesn't happen. And then we read in verse 8, And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately, this man had been this way for 38 years. Immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, that teaches us how God's grace works. This man didn't give the right response. Did that hinder the Lord in healing him? 
when the Lord said to Matthew, follow me, could Matthew have said no? No. You see, God's grace is saving grace. And there's nothing needed by us to make it work. That man didn't need to know how to answer the question properly. He was made to know after God did something for him. But he gave the wrong answer. And God saved him anyway. Aren't you thankful for that? God saved him anyway. John chapter 6. We're told of the miraculous feeding of 5,000 men, not including women and children. It was probably a group of anywhere between 15 and 20,000 men that the Lord saved. And this is recorded in all four Gospels. It's one of, the, one of the very few things that's recorded in all four Gospels. When he fed 5,000 men with two small fish, I suppose they were sardines, and five barley loaves, five biscuits. And at this time, he actually brought matter into existence that was not in the universe before this. Now, only God can do that. No man can cause matter to come into existence. Only God can do that. But what do we learn from this? we learn something about the miracle of creation. Salvation is a creative work of God. It's not him taking you and cleaning you up and improving you and making you live a better life. That's not what the scripture teaches with regard to God's salvation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, we're not talking about, you know, we talk about creative men and women. Well, if you want to be real technical, ain't no such thing. Uh, you may be gifted to uh, do things, and we're thankful for those gifts, but the only people that are creative is the Lord himself. He creates. He makes something that was not there before, and he causes it to be. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, the same power, actually more power, that was involved in the creation of the universe is involved in the salvation of the sinner in giving you a new heart, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Something that was not there before. Being born of the Spirit. Now, how much help did God have in physical creation? Absolutely none. How much help? How much cooperation does he have in a new creation? Absolutely none. Salvation is the creative work of God. Now the next miracle is in John chapter 9. Turn with me there. Verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is one of those stupid questions. I mean, it is a dumb question. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Well, he couldn't have sinned, uh, as they were thinking, before he was born. And you can't blame his parents. Now look at the Lord's answer. I love the Lord's answer. And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now remember that. That's the reason for everything. You don't need to understand all the whys and the wherefores, but God is the first cause of everything. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage, take the clouds you so much dread, are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. 
Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace behind a frowning providence. He hides a smiling face. This man was born blind. And the Lord gives the reason why. That the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it's day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, salvation, everybody in this room and outside of this room, at one time was utterly blind to the character of God. The things you naturally think about God are completely wrong. You're blind. The natural man is blind to his own character. No natural man can understand sin. They understand that sin brings trouble. Sin brings problems. It brings problems in my life. There's no question about that. I mean, the, the problems sin brings in our society. But that's not understanding sin. It takes a holy nature to understand sin. You have to be born again to have any understanding of how sinful you are. And when you're born of God, you find out that all you are is sin. The natural man's blind to that, and he's blind to the way of salvation by Christ. He's blind to the way of salvation by grace. He can't see. Blind Bartimaeus. Somebody once said he was blind. He was plumb blind. He was stone blind. And that was this man, born blind. And Christ gave him sight. He gave him sight to see the character of God. He gave him sight to see his own sinfulness. And he gave him sight to see the way of salvation by Christ. And the last miracle is found in John chapter 11. That's such a Beautiful chapter, but you'll remember, I'm just going to tell you what happened. It'd be to my benefit and yours to go back and read it. But Lazarus was somebody that the Lord loved. I love the way it says, now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. They were objects of his affection and of his love. And Lazarus died. And when they had sent someone to tell the Lord about he was sick, that he was sick, he stayed behind. He didn't come to heal him right off because he was going to let him die. He knew he was going to die. And so by the time the Lord got there, Lazarus had already been dead for four days. And he had actually began to stink. The process of decay had become such that you couldn't even be around him. And what did the Lord do? Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Resurrection from the dead. Now, if I'm going to understand anything about the gospel, I'm going to have to understand something about resurrection from the dead. First, Christ's resurrection from the dead. One of the great miracles that I can't wrap my head around is how Christ died in the first place. <laughs> That's a mystery. Tis mystery all the immortal dies who can understand his strange design. In vain the firstborn seraph cries, speaking of the death of Christ. But I know why he died. I don't know how the God-man could die, but he did. But I do know why he died. He died because of sin. He was delivered for our offenses. My sin became his sin, but the scripture says he was raised for our justification. You see, everybody he lived for, died for, was buried for, and raised for is justified before God. Listen to me, child of God. 
You don't have any sin. You stand before God without guilt, perfectly righteous, having never sinned. But I have sinned. Yeah, but God justified you. That's what the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ accomplished. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. You may have sin heavy on your heart right now, but if you're a child of God, you're justified before God. It never happened. You stand before God without guilt. The second resurrection is the spiritual resurrection. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Spiritual resurrection. You were dead in sins. God birthed you into his kingdom. You now live. And the final resurrection, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. You know, the death of the believer is called a sleep. Remember what the Lord said about Lazarus, our friend Lazarus, sleepeth. Well, he was dead. Yeah, but the death of a believer is nothing but a sleep. A sleep in Christ. You see, they still live in him. If, I'm, if Christ is alive, I'm alive even when I'm dead. I'm in him. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn back to John chapter 20. They spoke of the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. God had done with the Gentiles, the miracles of salvation. Verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were, were not written in this book, but these are written, that who? You might believe. This is why this is written, that you, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that believing, believing that Jesus Christ, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Believing you might have life through his name. May God enable each one of us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I believe that. I do, I believe that. And believing you might have life through his name. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the miracles and wonders of thy salvation. Lord, to think that 
we're made to be what we were not, the very righteousness of God, because your son was made to be what he was not, sin. Lord, how we celebrate the sovereign will of your son in salvation, that salvation comes when he wills it. Lord, how we thank you for your grace that will not take no for an answer, and will not take our inability to understand for an answer. How we thank you for the creative aspect of your salvation. How we thank you for sight. And Lord, how we thank you for the resurrection of Christ from the dead. How we thank you for the spiritual resurrection of your people. And Lord, we long for that time when we will be raised incorruptible, perfectly conformed to the likeness of thy Son. Bless this message for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dwayne.